Yep. Hey there, I am Dr. Amy King, otherwise known as Dr. Amy, and this podcast is the most important medicine. If you don't know me, I'm a licensed psychologist, trainer, and consultant, and on this podcast, we're here to discuss how talking about trauma and providing a space for physicians and other professionals to share their experiences is how we transform medicine. I work with physicians and healthcare organizations on the daily and every time we talk about trauma and I hint about having discussions about trauma, I met with either one of two things, either intense compassionate curiosity or a little skepticism. And that's what we're here for today, to make understanding and discussing trauma accessible and even more important, how to respond to trauma so that you feel more competent as a provider. Every time you join me, I want you to hear practical information and lead with tangible tools that you can use with patients every day. Um, I am so excited. Today, we are joined by Dr. Deborah Korn. Uh, Dr. Korn is a clinical psychologist with a private practice in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She is on the faculty of the EMDR Institute in California and the Trauma Research Foundation in Boston. She is an EMDR International Association approved consultant and presents and consults internationally on the treatment of adult survivors of childhood abuse and neglect. Um, she also has a new book out, which we'll talk about as we go along. And those of you that are watching the video, you can see the beautiful book. It's called Every Memory Deserves Respect, EMDR, The Proven Trauma Therapy and the Power to Heal. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much, Amy. It's just a pleasure to be here with you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about the book, and there's a couple of little sections you can see I have tabbed yeah. off here. But, um, we'll link up to it in the show notes, but if you um, have a chance to look at this book, um, first of all, it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful book, um, and we'll come back to this. I first heard you speak, though, on Guy McPherson's podcast. And I was so moved by your compassion for the clients that you see and their stories. And I know so many listeners will be interested in your work um, and specifically what EMDR is. Mm -hmm. um, but before we dive in, I kind of gave your formal introduction. Is there anything else you want to add about yourself, about who you are or what you do? Well, I think the only thing that I'd add is um, that right now in my life, I'm on a mission. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the mission has to do with being a mental health advocate, trying mm -hmm. to work toward a place where we live in more of a trauma informed society. Um, one of the reasons I decided to write this book is, was, is to get information out to the public, accessible, digestible information about trauma, about recovery, about EMDR therapy, in particular, the therapy that I discuss in the book. But I just find that there's still so much misinformation out there and people are still afraid to seek treatment, still held back because of stigma. And um, I just really wanted to do my part in trying to let people know that they don't have to suffer, they don't have to suffer alone, and there are efficient, effective ways to heal. Um, so that's just a big part of where I am right now um, in terms of my professional life. I love it. I love it. Before we hit record today, Deborah and I were talking, we're on a joint mission, right? To be out of a job. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, that's exactly. And practice a trauma-informed way of life and being and profession. So that's a great place to start. Um, for our listeners, how would you define the word trauma? What is trauma? Mm. Well, in my mind, trauma is a part of life, right? 70% of adults have experienced at least one significant trauma in their lives. Most have experienced more than that. Um, we define trauma in our book as any experience that feels overwhelming, triggers strong negative emotions like shame or terror, and involves a sense of powerlessness or intense vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say that trauma is both objective and subjective. It's both the event, what has happened to you, what you've experienced, and also how you experience that event. So no two people are going to experience a moment in time and experience in the same way. And what might be traumatic for one person may not be traumatic for the next. It has to do with your own physiology, 
your own life circumstances, your own history. But we do know that the greater the number of traumas, the greater the psychological and physical toll, the more trauma exposure, the more likely people are to be struggling in their lives. And we also know that trauma is cumulative and it's developmentally bound. And what that means is the more trauma you had, as I said, uh, the, the more likely you are to be to become symptomatic, to struggle in specific ways. And the younger you are, those who are, you know, young children, adolescents are the most vulnerable, right? They don't have the, the repertoire of resources or supports that, that, that adults typically have. Yeah. I, I want to go back to this idea that trauma is both objective and subjective, because mm -hmm. on this podcast, we're often talking about how trauma can present in the field of medicine. And, right. you know, medicine often feels like a very objective space, right? There's, there's, you know, um, right and wrong. There's not a ton of gray all the time. We want to have answers, right? Even though we call it practicing medicine. Yes. Um, but it's important that if a patient's coming in to a, a provider, that I, I really appreciate what you said that trauma is subjective because a provider might be going through a health history, right? And not think that something may have been traumatic. So right. can we back up? How, how would you help a physician understand how trauma might present? Well, trauma can present in a multitude of ways. It might show up as an emotional response to something going on in the person's life. So a response that somehow seems more intense, more active than you might expect. So it might be a fear response. It might be a grief response. It might be um, a shame response to mm -hmm. something out in the world or even something that the doctor says to the client. And all of a sudden the client is looking at their feet and they can't speak and mm -hmm. the doctor has no idea what's just gotten activated. So it might be emotional. It might be physical, right? Unexplained medical symptoms, right? Have clients who've had every test in the world can explain why they're having certain pain symptoms or certain cardiac symptoms or certain, mm -hmm. um, uh, digestive issues. Um, very often trauma ex expresses itself through the body. We know that Bessel van der Kolk has a very well-known book, um, number one on the New York Times bestseller list for 200 weeks called The Body Keeps the Score. And the idea there is that trauma speaks through the body. Trauma often gets frozen and locked in the nervous system and expresses itself in all kinds of physical ways. Um, you might even hear from a client that they're having difficulties behaviorally, right? They can't, they feel frozen. They can't get up and move. They don't have energy or they find themselves reactive, right? Wanting to lash out physically, wanting to throw things, not knowing where that's coming from. So very often you have these range of uh, experiences. I, I forgot to mention thoughts as well. The client who comes in and says, you know, doc, I'm doing really well in my life. My job is going well and everything's okay in my family, but I'm miserable, right? I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm, um, you know, I feel worthless. I feel not good enough all the time. So there's a real discrepancy between the picture of the person's life and the symptoms that they're experiencing. So what it means is that we want to look more carefully. We want to explore for the origins of these symptoms um, that are not easily explained by anything necessarily obvious in the person's life, mm -hmm. right? And so-, so to, to recap for folks, it's objective and subjective and physicians or healthcare providers, they might see it come up emotionally, physically, behaviorally, through thoughts. But really what you're saying is if you're having a patient come in and they have some complexities, you know, a cardiac presentation, shortness of breath, uh, having a tough time at work or kind of managing life, one thing you want them to be thinking of is, is this trauma? Is there something else going on for this person that's beyond like a physical? Right. Thing? And it's so important to ask um, when did this begin? What was going on in your life? Mm. Is this more recent? 
Could we trace this back to earlier in your life? When's the very first time you experienced this thought, this feeling, this sensation, this medical symptom? Because we're looking for the origins. We're looking for the foundational experiences that never got fully processed. Okay, right? they, okay, hold on. Because mm -hmm. you're a psychologist, I'm a psychologist, right? Now, now we're going there, right? Because okay. every physician and healthcare provider mm -hmm. listening is going to say, you want me to ask what? <laughs> you want right. me to ask about the or origin of trauma? Like I'm never going to get out of that exam room. Right. What might you say? Right. You know, I would say if you want your client to get well, if you want to uncover the uh, core, the mm -hmm. etiology of some of these symptoms, so you can get this patient connected to appropriate treatment, whether it's medical treatment or whether it's psychological treatment, ask the questions. Yeah. Clients want to be asked. Patients want to be asked, right? Oh, They've so probably been afraid for most of their lives to talk about things. But I find when I ask and when I encourage physicians to ask, clients are ready to explore that territory. And they understand that they have a 15 minute session. They understand that they have a half hour appointment mm -hmm. and that they can't go into it all, but they wanna be asked. They want a human being to notice that they are in distress, that they are suffering and they want, they just want someone to take interest. And that can be the beginning of a new chapter for someone in terms of getting to some treatment that could make a difference in I, their physical well-being. I 100% agree with you, Deborah. And I, I, I hope that people who are listening here, that desire to want to be asked, to want mm -hmm. to be seen, Mm -hmm. is so powerful as humans. And, and often what I tell healthcare professionals is, uh, you know, they don't want to do therapy with you, no. but to be asked to be noticed that they're going through something that's hard, whether it be then or, you know, many years ago, yes. begins often a healing process for them. Yes. Yes. And, you know, how do you ask about trauma? You know, some clients will know exactly how to respond if you say, have you ever experienced a trauma in your life? Have you ever had any physical or sexual or emotional abuse? Some clients will respond to that. They're versed in that language. But for other clients, you, you might want to simply ask, you know, have you ha experienced hard things in your right. life? Right. right. Have you um, have you been scared in your life before? Have you felt like your life has been out of control? Have you, were you raised by a parent who was either frightening or frightened themselves, right? Is a, another way to ask I, it. I really appreciate all these different ways other than asking about, you know, trauma with a capital T, you can ask about, you know, adverse life events or things that have changed in their life. Um, and I love what you just said, frightening or frightened. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, is it different in your experience for kids? Like, how trauma presents for them. You had mentioned, you know, emotional, physical, behavioral thoughts. Um, you know, kids can be a little bit more, you know, uh, different presentation. What do you notice about how trauma presents in them? Well, it's less likely to get expressed through words with kids. I'm not a, a child therapist, but the, the limited experience I've had and in conversations with my colleagues, I think trauma is much more likely to show up in drawings, in play, um, through you know, aggressive behavior or withdrawn behavior. So you're gonna see it behaviorally and you're gonna see it in, in the way children express themselves. Yeah, which yeah. tends not necessarily to be through words. Yeah. Why do you think it's so hard to talk about trauma? Well, I think um, now are we asking about whether it's hard for doctors to talk about trauma or whether it's hard for patients to talk about trauma or both? Well, I think you're right. I think patients are actually reassured often to be asked, but why do you think it's hard in healthcare professions to talk about trauma? Either by the way, their own, which we could talk about or yeah. their patients. Yeah. 
Well, I, I would think that doctors think they're venturing beyond their education, their expertise. Mm -hmm. I would think that they are fearful about being intrusive, that they're going to be crossing some boundary or they're going to make their patient feel uncomfortable in some way. Um, perhaps docs are afraid that they're going to activate, they're going to trigger something, they're going to trigger memories. And before they know it, you're, they're going to have a a patient sitting in front of them that's having a flashback or having intrusive memories or is flooded with despair or grief or, or a patient that's suddenly going to be uh, suicidal uh, mm -hmm. right in front of them and they're not going to know how to respond to that or not going to have the time to respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, you know, I think most of the folks that we sit with, whether it's me as a psychologist or medical doctors, you know, have a sense of the environment, have a sense of the context. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to share more than they're ready to share. If they are ready to share, they'll choose to share. Mm -hmm. And um, and if the doctor can respond simply in that generous human way, you know, thank you so much for sharing with me. This is so important. This may be really, really important in terms of understanding some of the medical symptoms that you're having. You know, you're very courageous and brave for sharing this with me. I think this will be helpful for us to know about going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need to interpret. They don't need to have 12 strategies that the client needs to go home with. Um, they need to simply respond as a caring human being that, you know, is interested. And, and what I try to tell providers is that they do that all the time. That's right. Right. They're, they do that all the time. If, if a blood count comes back, uh, you know, bad, or they have to give a diagnosis, um, a medical diagnosis of, of some kind, they already have those capacities. I think it feels scary because we're talking about something emotional now yes. um, that they feel beyond, but I love what you're saying, right? Just responding with compassion and validating, being respectful of the space. Um, oh, and, yeah, and, and it's important that the doctor, him or herself, stay grounded <laughs> in their own body. Now, what do I mean by that? Yeah. That, they, that they don't start getting anxious and talking fast. If, mm -hmm. if the doctor can stay calm and focused, the, the patient's going to feel that. Mm -hmm. The patient's nervous system is going to feel that. feel that. Like this is a safe space. This is a calm space. I've got somebody here that's not going to be overwhelmed, not going to be freaked out by anything I share. Mm -hmm. And they're going to respond accordingly. So that begs a question for physicians and other healthcare professionals. How do I get there? How do, how do I learn how to be in a grounded space mm -hmm. so that I can show up for patients? you have right. thoughts or ideas on that? Right. Well, you know, in this day and age, you can go on the internet and there are, there are endless YouTube videos, various videos from professionals that you can pull up that will walk you through everything from different kinds of breathing to how to ground your entire body, to how to focus on certain things in your environment that soothe your nervous system and help you get regulated, um, how to create um, you know, imagery of like a container where you can put stuff away. Like if a physician comes into work and things are chaos in his or her, her own life, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what do you do with that stuff? Can you use imagery and imagination to kind of put it away, to hold it off to the side? If a physician's own trauma history is getting unsettled, is there a way to contain it, put it off to the side? Um, and I suspect that you've probably talked about polyvagal theory um, in your show previously. Is that? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, we well, talked about the, the, the trauma and neurobiology a bit and how it shows yeah not specifically polyvagal theory? Uh, I think polyvagal theory is mm -hmm. uh, a, a theory that is applicable across many, many professions. I think teachers should be learning about polyvagal theory and lawyers and doctors. And it's basically about how to care for your nervous system mm -hmm. and how to stay regulated within yourself so you can take care of the people within your care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I I won't 
I couldn't agree more. And so we'll, we, I can actually link up to some polyvagal information in the show notes for people, mm -hmm. but 100%. And I think it's a way too, to kind of um, intersect, you know, therapy and mental health with medicine is talking about that neurobiological response that any of us has when we have gone through adversity or trauma. Absolutely. And um, I'll be sure to uh, give you the name of a book that was written by two physicians oh, um, or at least one physician but two professionals who work with children and very, very young children um, who talk about applications of polyvagal theory in medicine. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, so let me, let me shift for a minute to this incredible book that you've written. Um, mm -hmm. It's about EMDR. And um, for those of you that are listening, you may not be able to see some of these pictures, but what Deborah and her co-author have done is just really created beautiful imagery, beautiful graphics throughout the whole book that message about trauma. But before we dive into that, will you just, can you briefly describe for folks, what is EMDR? Sure. So EMDR stands for eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. It is a mouthful, <laughs> it's an earful. Um, let me break it down a little bit. Desensitization uh, refers to the reduction of distress, fear, and anxiety. Reprocessing uh, relates to the, the reevaluation or the restructuring of thoughts and beliefs and the transformation of one's sense of self relative to past traumatic experiences. It's about moving the past into the past so people can live more fully in the present. Now, the eye movement part, Francine Shapiro, the developer of EMDR, accidentally discovered that purposely moving your eyes horizontally back and forth while focusing on a traumatic memory leads to a reduction in the vividness and the emotional intensity of the memory. She wow. developed an effective protocol for treating post-traumatic stress disorder and other trauma-related problems using this bilateral simulation and published the first study um, back in 1989, working with uh, rape survivors and Vietnam combat veterans. So hence the name eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And basically it's a memory focused psychotherapy that helps people deal with the impact and the legacy of trauma in their lives, the, the legacy of adverse experiences. And it's based on the idea very simply that psychological problems are related to a failure to adequately process traumatic experiences and memories, right? And these unprocessed traumatic memories that are kind of frozen or locked in our nervous system, along with the feelings, the sensations, the thoughts, the impulses that were part of that original experience, those memories continue to affect how we perceive things, decisions we make, reactions we have, the beliefs we hold about ourselves. And present day triggers, situations that are somehow related, somehow similar to the original traumatic experience, these triggers activate unprocessed traumatic memories leading to symptoms that cause ongoing distress. So a lot of providers listening will be familiar with making referrals for therapy for patients of theirs that, that need to process trauma or have experienced some kind of adversity. And I think often they think about talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy or even trauma yeah. focused. How is EMDR different than traditional talk therapy? Well, in EMDR, we work primarily with affect, with emotion and the body, right? We activate memories from the get-go and we want to bring that disturbance. We want to bring the distress into the present moment so it can be healed, so it can be processed to resolution. In talk therapy, we don't necessarily get at the body. We don't necessarily get deep at the emotions. And so you can talk about things up here and never actually activate memories where they're held in the nervous system. And therefore you're not able to transform at these deeper levels. And so, um, you know, by activating from the beginning, ask a asking a client to think about a memory and focus on the feelings, the sensations, the images, the sounds, all of the components, we're really working to access that memory fully so it can be opened up, 
worked through and then put back into storage in a desensitized form. Wow. Um, the title of your book, Every Memory Deserves Respect, also alludes to hope. Yeah. You say the power to heal. Right. Can you um, tell us a, a story perhaps about a client or a patient of yours um, with, with protecting their privacy, of course, um, where they, they went through EMDR and were able to reprocess those memories. And yes, yeah. sure. Well, you know what, since this is a program um, that is designed to reach out to folks in the medical profession, I, I will share a story with somebody that I worked with during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I got a call from a man who is a doctor in a local ER here in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. And um, he came seeking treatment because um, he was finding that he was unable to go into work. He was depressed, he was anxious, he had lost his motivation, he, you know, burnout was an underestimation of, you know, a way to describe what he was experiencing. Um, and the thing, the kind of the straw that broke the camel's back was that he started throwing things at home. When he'd get upset, he'd pick up whatever was near him and started throwing things. And this really alarmed his wife. This was completely out of character. And in fact, there were a couple incidents of throwing things at work as well, which led him to take a leave of absence from work. Mm -hmm. As we started to explore the current triggers in his life, this was early in the pandemic. Of course, we can all imagine what the triggers were, right? He was inundated with very, very sick people. People were dying. People who he felt shouldn't be dying were dying because they didn't have the right equipment yet. Um, they were not getting the support that they needed in the ER from the administration. Um, and he just felt profoundly hopeless, profoundly overwhelmed, profoundly uh, inept at being able to do anything um, that was necessary to be able to save their lives in the way he was used to. Um, and we started to explore back from these recent trigger situations, these recent moments where he felt flooded with despair and overwhelmed and felt helpless, floating back from these moments where he would pick something up and throw it. And sure enough, it took us back to earlier experiences in his life. I found out, I learned in the first session with him that he grew up in a family where there was domestic violence, where his father was very abusive toward his mother. And as a little boy, he felt profoundly helpless to do anything to protect his mother, to save his mother. And he believes that his father could, he believed that his father could potentially kill his mother. He, wow. he thought any day that could happen and saw himself as needing to do something to save his mother, but he couldn't. He would, when things got rough, he would freeze, he'd hide behind the couch or a chair. And the only thing that he could do as a little, little boy was he would reach for something like a pillow and throw it at his father. Wow. And so that memory of feeling powerless and reaching for something to throw it was frozen and locked in his nervous system. And when those feelings of powerlessness were getting activated present day, that impulse was getting activated along with it. Long story short, we targeted a handful of memories from his childhood abuse, trauma experiences. We targeted with EMDR uh, recent experiences in the hospital. And then eventually, once we had kind of cleared, resolved the past, the present triggers, we moved into the future and helped him carry kind of his new beliefs about himself. I'm good, I'm capable, I have choices, I'm not powerless, there are things that I can do to be of service to others. Carrying those new beliefs, the new feelings, feeling strong, feeling capable again, carrying them into the future. You know, we kind of rehearsed through imagination, returning to work, returning to the hospital. We rehearsed facing moments of powerlessness again and being able to navigate them in new ways. And we used bilateral stimulation, which is the back and forth stimulation of EMDR to help integrate these new images, these new movies 
of uh, how he wanted things to be in the future. Okay, so um, if I'm listening to this as a, as a physician or even as a, as a physician wanting to help my patient, I might think, whoa, that had to have taken him years to work through all of that. Um, what, what can someone expect from EMDR to be able to have that kind of a transformation and realization? Yeah. Well, this particular client, I think, um, I think we, I may not be remembering clearly, but I think we worked for about six weeks, wow. um, weekly sessions. I think some weeks we might've met more than once and he was able to return to work. We continued to work even after he returned to work because he wanted to get even more resolution about his childhood trauma. It's gonna be different for every single client, right? It completely depends on an individual person's resources, their resilience, their support, their history, how extensive their trauma history is. You know, some early EMDR studies back in the early 90s showed that for a single episode trauma, like somebody who had a car accident or an assault, um, you could knock out PTSD in three or four sessions okay. around that particular incident. And that's what Francine Shapiro found in her oriz original research study. You know, more extensive trauma like combat trauma, you need at least 12 sessions. But then there, are, of course, there's gonna be clients who need to be in therapy for months, for years, because they have prolonged, repeated, um, early childhood trauma at multiple levels. And, you know, they're looking for comprehensive recovery and that's going to take a lot longer, but, but people can get relief in very short periods of time. That's it. That's what I want. People Some to, relief. Right? Yeah. Because initial I think, relief. I think when people think about therapy, especially around trauma, they think, oh gosh, I'm going to be laying on someone's couch for months and years. Right. And you're saying, hang on, there is hope you can have symptom relief very soon, right? A few weeks is yeah. an incredible investment to make in yourself, um, yeah. a necessary investment. Um, can I try something out on you? Yes, <laughs> you know, absolutely. I, as you were, as you were um, describing this physician, um, I was thinking about, you know, that cheesy phrase we have as psychologists, you got to name it to tame it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which I think is true, yeah. but what I just realize with EMDR is that you're adding, first you have to know it before you can name it mm -hmm. to tame it. And he didn't even know. No, no, he had no idea. And, you know, I, I, I want to bring up the example of Michael Baldwin, my co-author for Every Memory Deserves Respect. Michael uh, had seen eight therapists over the course of 22 years. He oh, had gosh. really yeah. given tremendous effort when it came to looking for looking for relief mm -hmm. and had gotten very, very little relief over those years. And then he got into treatment with Dr. Jeffrey Magnavita, one of my colleagues, mm -hmm. and um, began EMDR therapy right off the bat. Dr. Magnavita recognized early on that this was a, these were trauma-based difficulties that he was having, phobias, panic, um, um, you know, low self-esteem. Uh, he was afraid to go to the bathroom in public, public bathrooms. He was afraid of intimacy, had never had an intimate relationship across his lifetime. Dr. Magnavita quickly started to do some education with him, explain how much of this could be understood as trauma-based. And for the first time in all of these years, Michael began to see that in fact, he had been through some very hard things in his life that had never been resolved and were manifesting as these symptoms. And, um, and he spent two years in treatment with Dr. Magnavita. And I will attest to the fact he is really fully recovered. He is living a vibrant mm -hmm life you know he he is reconnected with a brother who bullied him for his entire childhood who he was completely estranged with and his brother is now in EMDR therapy oh, and the two of them talk every week just had a trip together you know have really resolved this trauma and uh, are really supporting one another and moving forward in their lives now so I mean a lot of hope 
that just goes to say too, right? Like if you're out there and you're looking for therapy and it hasn't fit for you yet, you haven't keep, found the right. Yeah. Keep looking, um, keep looking and look for something different. Don't look for the same. Yeah, yeah. There are many, many different varieties out there. You know, EMDR therapy is just one of many solid trauma-informed therapies and you need to find what's right for you. So I want to just um, show people a page that really speaks to me or spoke to me, especially with um, working in the healthcare field. And it's this one um, for folks that are watching on YouTube, they'll be able to see it, but it says, when there is no one to trust or turn to, we withdraw even from ourselves. And I think um, for folks who've experienced trauma and especially healthcare providers and everything they've faced over the last several years yes. with the pandemic, yes. um, so many of them feel alone yeah. and isolated. Um, can you talk about why writing this book was important to you um, to, to put those types of messages into the world? Why was that important? Well, people suffer alone, right? They don't know, number one, that there is relief, that there is treatment. They don't know that everyone around them is suffering as well and struggling. You know, whenever I'm with a group of people socially and someone dares to be vulnerable and sh share something they're struggling with, whether it's struggling with their kids, with parenting issues, or struggling in their marriage, or struggling with burnout at work, everyone else chimes in and says, yeah, I get it. I get it. And I just think we need to be giving permission um, to, to everyone out there, you know, no matter what your profession is, no matter whether you know, you're a stay-at-home dad or you're the president of a bank or you know, a doctor on the front lines, we wanna be giving permission to express what is difficult and challenging. You know, PTSD is a normal reaction to, to abnormal circumstances. And we have been living in abnormal circumstances for quite a while now. And, you know, most everyone has experienced some form of post-traumatic response. Maybe it doesn't reach the level of being diagnosed as PTSD or complex PTSD or, you know, any other diagnosis from our diagnostic manuals. But, um, but everyone has had these moments where they feel seized, hijacked by terror or grief or powerlessness. And um, I just hope that in writing this book, we're getting the message out that, um, that, you know, that we're all struggling at some level at, at some of the times and, um, and that there's, there's relief available. I, yeah. It's beautiful. Um, I, I want to underscore something that you just said, Deborah, so that people can hear it again. PTSD is a normal response to an abnormal experience. And, and if people, you know, I just know that um, with the rates of burnout um, amongst physicians and in healthcare organizations and the rate of physician suicide, if one person hears that today, and reaches out for help or support and says, oh my gosh, that I'm not alone, right? Um, I think your book does a beautiful job yeah. of, of describing that. I, I just wanted to add that Michael Baldwin, my co-author, um, he has said many times over that he particularly wants to reach out to men mm. because of the way men are socialized to be strong and tough and macho and you know to hold things in, um, he really just wanted to reach out and say, hey, you don't have to do this 24 seven. There, there are people you can sit with who will help you to unlock that latch and allow some of this stuff out so you can heal it. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you and thank Michael for the beautiful book. Um, for those of you, um, I'll link up to it in the show notes, but it's called Every Memory Deserves Respect, um, EMDR and the Proven Trauma Therapy with the Power to Heal. Um, Deborah, I just have a couple of what I call rapid fire questions real quick for you. Yeah. Um, what's, one, what's one thing you think people get wrong about trauma or trauma-informed work? 
Well, I think that people uh, believe that they have to talk about every last detail. Mm. Yeah. And so, you know, in EMDR therapy, you, you don't have to talk about much at all. Mm -hmm. You can focus on the body, you can focus on the emotion, and you don't even have to put words on it. So that's something that people get wrong. Yeah. I also think um, this idea uh, that the therapy will take forever, like you said, that they'll be lying on the couch forever <laughs> is really a myth. You know, we, we have a very efficient, we have a very cost efficient treatment um, to offer people at this point in time. And that's important to know. And, um, and then finally, uh, I think uh, I want people to know that the therapist, the EMDR therapist is there to accompany you. Mm. The th I always say to my clients, I'm right here at your side. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to let you drown. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And um, you're going to have a partner, right? You don't have to do it by yourself. Your therapist will help you pace the work. Mm. Um, so this idea that of a, of a neutral therapist or the, you know, the blank slate is a very, very old notion. Mm. And uh, instead of that, we've got you know, the face of a therapist who's compassionate, who, who sees you and hears you and um, is going to be there to accompany you. Well, and I think about how healing just that statement is for so many people who've gone through trauma alone. They're not alone anymore. That's here right. I am, here I am, I'm going to walk with you. Right. Um, so you, you said that, you know, part of writing this book is your mission to put information out there for people. Um, if you could go back and talk to young Dr. Korn, um, what would you tell her? I think I would tell her um, just to be a human being, mm. right? My training, you know, uh, emphasized a lot the importance of boundaries and formalities and all of that. And of course, boundaries are very, very important in therapy. Clients need to feel safe, need to understand that they're not going to be pushed towards something that doesn't feel right or comfortable for them. But I think, you know, what I've learned over time is to share more of myself to, you know, I'll say things with um, clients now, like, my heart is breaking as I'm imagining that little girl who went through that horrible experience. You know, so I've learned that it's very important for my clients to see my emotions when I'm affected by them, because for so many, um, they never learned that they mattered, mm -hmm. right? They never had a safe adult responding to them and really acknowledging that they exist. <laughs> And so responding from my heart, responding emotionally um, and really communicating with my voice, with my face in every way I know how that I'm here with you, you're not alone is really, really important. And that's, that's a far cry from where I started. Yeah, oh my gosh, me too, <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, so on that note, um, I think sometimes people think, you know, therapists were like these touchy feely people. And um, will you share one thing about you that just makes you perfectly imperfect as a human being? <laughs> um, I would say that I still really struggle when people get mad at me. I have to really work to regulate myself, calm myself down, not get defensive, not, you know, go into a shame place and back away. You know, I've done my own work around that. I still get caught at times, but I can see it happening now and um, know how, how to work with myself. But, uh, but those are still really challenging moments for me, both in therapy and in life. It's such a good reminder, right? That we're all still working on something. Yeah. We're all works in progress. Absolutely. Um, last question, probably the hardest one. Um, it's 11 o'clock at night and you have a food craving. What do you reach for? <laughs> uh, I reach for ice cream, of course. Awesome. Any particular kind? Chocolate chip. 
chocolate chip. All right. Uh, there's lots of ice cream fans on this podcast. So who knew? It's a, It must be a, a. I think it's pretty universal. <laughs> it's up there as, you know, as one of those foods that you got to have when you got to have it. Yeah. Um, thank you, Deborah. Thanks for being a guest. I think um, you've probably opened up a lot of people's eyes today in terms of how trauma presents. I love what you talked about earlier in terms of objective and subjective. And if you haven't had a chance, folks, please grab a copy of Deborah's book. It's, it's wherever you can get a book now, right, Deborah? Wherever you can get a book, online, brick and mortar. It's also an audible for people oh. who prefer to listen. Perfect. So I'll link up to it in the show notes. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the mission that you're on with this work. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it's changing lives. Thank you to Michael as well. Um, and I appreciate you being on the podcast today. Thank you, Amy. I enjoyed this tremendously and good luck with all that you are working to do as well. Thank you.